Thank you. We now turn to uh, topical questions. And question number one, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether to provide an update on progress that it has made in delivering the National CAP loan scheme. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, I announced the National Basic Payment Support Scheme for 2016 to Parliament on the 13th of September, and delivery has proceeded on the timescale set out in that announcement. Letters inviting farmers and crofters to apply for a loan were issued dated 27th September, and everyone eligible to apply for a loan should receive their letter this week. Regrettably, after letters were sent, manual checking of a sample of the calculations uncovered an undervaluation of entitlement, which affected some potential applicants. Clearly, this is regrettable, and I appreciate fully that it will have caused confusion for those receiving letters. Revised loan letters will be issued to the affected farmers and crofters this week. However, I think it's important to note that no farmer and no crofter entitled to receive a loan will be worse off as a result of this undervaluation. Indeed, every single farmer or crofter affected will be entitled to receive more than they have been originally notified of. Stuart Stevenson. Um, th thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary for his explanation uh, and assurance in what are clearly difficult uh, circumstances. Uh, can uh, he advise uh, when all payments can be expected to be made, made under this scheme uh, after the closure of applications in about two weeks' time? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, yes, I can advise that uh, our aim is that the bulk of the payments should be made in the first fortnight of November. Uh, that is still our intention. Um, I would not use the term closure because uh, uh, we have asked farmers to return the form by the 12th of October, and those affected by the adjustment following the undervaluation will be given a further week within which to do so. But there is no cut-off period no one is excluded if they don't meet these deadlines. In other words, those who miss those deadlines will still receive a loan payment, but they may not receive it at the same time as everyone else whose forms are returned timelessly. Mr. Stevenson. Um, I'm sure that uh, flexibility that the government is showing will be a very welcome, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, you previously stated in your statement to Parliament that there are a small number of businesses would not qualify uh, for a loan. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary give an indication of uh, how many might be involved, why they might not receive a loan, and what help might be forthcoming for them? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, there are some businesses, uh, a relatively small minority of businesses, that will not receive a loan offer at this stage, and that is because of the complexity of their cases. Uh, there are a variety of cases in this category, uh, and we are uh, absolutely determined to work through all of these cases, and as the validity of each one is resolved, where eligibility is established, loan offers will be issued on a case-by-case -case basis. Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I remind the Chamber of my farming interest in the register. The shambles continues. To be frank, you could hardly make it up. But my question is, can the Cabinet Secretary explain why only an estimated 17,000 farmers has to be offered a loan under this scheme, rather than the 18,300 businesses that are eligible for CAP payments? And are these the same businesses that are still awaiting substantial sums of money from the 2015 scheme? In other words, are they facing a double whammy? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, uh, we expect to, to issue loan offers to more than 17,000, so I, I don't agree with that part of the contention. Uh, uh, I am able to provide more details uh, in the time available tomorrow when there will be a statement on this matter. Uh, but I would respectfully point out to the member that aside from the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats, I believe that the loan scheme which I announced has been broadly welcomed by the NFU and certainly by individual farmers and crofters to whom I've spoken, not least because the loan payments, in most cases 80% of entitlement of basic, basic uh, payments, 
uh, will be received earlier than in normal years, uh, considerably earlier, and that has the fortunate benefit that there will be a substantial injection into the rural economy of up to £300 million uh, in uh, the course of November. Uh, and I'm very pleased that that has been welcomed by the overwhelming majority of people, albeit out with this chamber. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, President Officer. Um, the Cabinet Secretary said the mistake was picked up on manual checking. Can I ask if this was a fault with another fault with the new computer system? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, as soon as I was alerted to this matter, I instructed an internal investigation to be conducted and that that investigation be conducted by, those, uh, by an independent team, in other words, not people who were directly involved in the administration. Um, and therefore, I think it best to wait until the, uh, the results of that investigation are known. I will certainly come back to the member and other members in this chamber once that investigation has uh, taken place. Uh, and I intend to ensure that it is conducted uh, with due expedition. Mike Rumbles. <clears throat> On Thursday morning, uh, Mr Ewing's officials told the audit committee of this parliament that farmers had nothing to worry about and IT problems with the system were being fixed. By the afternoon, we knew another shambles was in the offing as hundreds of farmers were left in the dark over their loan applications. Could I ask the minister why his officials were not more forthcoming when they came to this Parliament's Audit Committee on Thursday morning? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I don't accept the, the uh, assertions made by, by Mr Rumbles. First of all, he asserts that this was of necessity an IT problem. I've just given an answer a moment ago where I've said that the precise nature of why the mistake arose, well, I'm being barracked again by Mr Rumbles as uh, is normally the course. But let me repeat, a moment ago, I said in answer to Rhoda Grant that we are quite appropriately carrying out an internal investigation as to precisely what went wrong. I think it better to wait for the outcome of that, frankly, presiding officer, before one assumes, and Mr. Rumbles did a moment ago, that it is of necessity related to the IT uh, problem. I'm absolutely delighted that the officials, uh, I am absolutely delighted, sorry, there he goes again, presiding officer. I'm absolutely delighted that my officials uh, corrected this error. They spotted it uh, almost immediately and no one, not one farmer and not one crofter will lose a penny piece as regards this matter. I'm delighted that we have taken the step of responding to the situation by providing a nas national payment scheme which will inject a considerable amount of money into the rural economy. And I'm also pleased that that seems to be a policy that has the broad support of the farming community if not of Mr Rumbles. John Scott. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. And declaring an interest, presiding officer as a farmer, Cabinet Secretary will be very well aware of the growing clamour about the continuing failure of basic payments to be made from the, for the 2015 year with approximately 700 recipients still waiting for their payment. And Peter Chapman's question still remains unanswered about this group. Will they in fact be the same group uh, suffering twice uh, from excluding from payments. My own question, of course, around this is, will the loan scheme for 80% of the 2016 basic payment, while, well, of course, that's welcome, can the Cabinet Secretary tell us when the remaining 20% is likely to be paid to give certainty to cash flow predictions for hard-pressed farmers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I do think that goes somewhat beyond the province of, of this question, if I may say so, Presiding Officer, because it relates to the loan scheme. Uh, but I'm happy to say that in response to Mr Scott's question, two things. Firstly, I will provide more information about that in the time that we will have tomorrow when we have considerably more time. And secondly, I can assure Mr Scott uh, that uh, my officials are uh, working extremely hard to make sure that the balance of the payments in respect of uh, the basic payments, the Pillar 1 payments uh, due to farmers are paid uh, as quickly as possible. And I will come back with uh, some more information about that for Mr Scott and other members tomorrow. Neil Findlay. Uh, since people are declaring an interest, can I declare an interest as a taxpayer? Um, this appears to be the latest in a long line of shambolic Scottish Government IT project fiascos. If the Government can't sort out farm payments, what chance have we got when the benefit system, some of the benefit system is transferred to them? But 
on the farm payments, how much taxpayers' money overall in all of this has been poured down the drain? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the cost to the taxpayer of the mistake, which was corrected immediately, will be the cost of posting out the letters. Edward Mountain. Uh, I'd like to declare an interest in that I, I'm a partner in a farm partnership. Can, can the Cabinet Secretary please give us an idea of how many letters were actually sent out and therefore how many people were given the wrong information? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I've already said that uh, a relatively small minority of uh, farmers were affected. Uh, and uh, I will come back to the Chamber with full details in the statement which, uh, thanks to the Parliamentary Bureau, I'm able to make tomorrow. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And we will move a motion to that effect later today, calling for a statement at 2.40 tomorrow for members' interest. Question number two, Tavish Scott. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what environmental assessment it has made of the leak from the clear oil platform west of Shetland. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Marine Scotland has been working with the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, the Joint Nature Conservation Committee and the Operator BP to assess the environmental impact of the leak from the clear field. It is understood that the oil came from the produced water system rather than a leak from the well. Initial aerial surveillance and modelling show that the oil is moving north-northeast from the platform. This presents a low risk to environmental sensitivities such as seabirds and seabed features and has informed Marine Scotland's advice that the most appropriate response is to allow the oil to disperse naturally. BP has been requested to carry out further modelling to allow a full environmental impact assessment to be undertaken. BP is also deploying a vessel to the area which will take water samples. Marine Scotland will be passed the information for review. Sorry, Tavish Scott. Thank you. Um, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, response? Does she accept the inherent risks of oil and gas extraction uh, in the uh, UK continental shelf and particularly west of Shetland, both to the offshore workforce, who it is important not to forget in these occasions, and indeed the marine environment? Will she ensure that BP and indeed other operators guard against those risks through, ro through robust operational procedures and measures to minimise any impact uh, of spillages at sea? And would she be able to confirm whether BP, uh, BP's Clearfield op has operated since 2005, indeed without any spill that we're aware of. Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as to the last point, I believe uh, Tavish Scott is correct that this is the first such uh, uh, incident since the Clearfield uh, began uh, operations. Uh, on the more general issue, uh, all uh, um, industrial activity has to have regard to safety uh, safety of its workforce, um, safety of the environment, uh, and all of that is taken into account uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, in this particular set of circumstances, uh, the environmental risk has been assessed as uh, low, uh, but of course there are always going to be uh, some potential uh, 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 for um, things like this happening uh, in the future. However, we need to remember the importance of the oil and gas industry to the Scottish economy. Um, I would also remind the Chamber that in actual fact the regulator for the oil and gas industry is the uh, Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, they are investigating, it is they who will carry out any enforcement action if that is considered necessary. Tavish Scott. Can I, uh, can, I, can I again thank the Cabinet Secretary for those replies? Um, can I take it that the in BP's environmental assessment has been shared uh, with the Scottish Government? Uh, does she understand that this states uh, there is some risk of, uh, of seabirds being oiled uh, to the north northeast, as she's already uh, outlined? And finally, has the uh, Government been informed of uh, what happened in respect of why this spill occurred and when they hope to find out the details of making sure this will not happen again? Um, uh, that's uh, on three different areas. I, I think the issue about the when we find out is when uh, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial uh, uh, Strategy finalises its review um, and, and that information uh, should be shared with us. Um, the, the issue of the impact on the seabed, that is not a, a, a current concern, it has to be said. 
What, what we have is a situation uh, where the oil may sink to a depth of about 25 metres, but the seabed in this particular area is at 140 metres, with the nearest marine protected area some 20 kilometres away in water depths of between 300 and 600 metres. So uh, the advice about the, uh, the um, natural dispersal has been accepted uh, as being uh, the best uh, way to proceed at present on the information that we have. As I indicated in my uh, original answer, BP um, are, have been requested to carry out further modelling. They, uh, uh, we're looking at the potential for a full environmental impact assessment to be undertaken. They're deploying a vessel to the area that is taking further water samples, uh, and that is information, of course, which will be passed to Marine Scotland in due course. Morris Golden. Given that there are 571 platforms in the North Sea, which, if removed via a single lift, require to be floated past Scotland, risking environmental harm to decommissioning yards big enough to handle them in England or elsewhere, uh, what plans do the Scottish Government have to support a large-scale decommissioning port in Shetland or elsewhere in order to provide jobs and realise the true value of decommissioning for Scotland as part of our journey to a more circular economy? I think this is fairly broad for the Minister. If the Minister wishes to give a short answer. It's a little beyond my own portfolio responsibilities, presiding officer, but of course the Scottish Government is always on the lookout for potential uh, uh, further development that may help uh, the economy of Scotland. Thank you. John Finney. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, environmental assessments are very important as are our marine protection areas and certainly I'm concerned about a pattern of marine behaviour that places our oceans at risk. Now the BP spokesman said and I quote the release was stopped within an hour. The Transocean winner was carrying 280 tonnes of diesel when it ran aground off Lewis. Cromarty First Port Authority plans to transfer 8.4 million tonnes of oil between ships in the open seas of the Murray Firth. In the report uh, that you referred to M Marine Scotland in February this year, they talked about the increased area of activity being the service they provide for ministers on emergency responses to maritime incidents. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that the Scottish Government needs to be more robust to head off emergencies, and they can do that by formally objecting to the ship-to-ship -ship transfer in the open seas and supporting robust action against reckless and negligent operators? Um, and of course, if you do that, they'll not only and I see you shaking your head, but I think it's an important issue that not only protect the pod of orcas that f uh, uh, swim between Iceland and the Murray Firth coast, but also protect wider marine life, our fishermen and our tourist industry. Again, it's quite a broad follow-up. <laughs> it, it also, uh, with the greatest of respect, presiding officer, ranges over a number of different areas which are not actually covered by the question, because I think the initial uh, uh, comments being made by John Finney relate to the, uh, the rig that ran aground uh, in, on Lewis rather than this particular well, you know, the, 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 he's referring to things that don't actually relate directly to this particular incident. Um, uh, as I've indicated, the regulator of the oil and gas industry is the Westminster Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Now, Marine Scotland is a consultee in, in that process, uh, and uh, uh, we will obviously, in the Scottish Government, continue to liaise with key stakeholders, such as BP, uh, and any others who are involved in any of the incidents that may uh, or may not happen. Um, but I, I reiterate again that uh, oil and gas industry is extremely important to the Scottish economy. Um, we're relying on a mixed energy portfolio, uh, and it's a, an integral part uh, of that. Uh, it is important that we do uh, maximise recovery from the North Sea, but of course we have to do that in a responsible and efficient manner. Uh, a successful sector is also important to help us transition to a low carbon economy where the skills and capabilities built up over decades will be critical. So this is a constant balance of, uh, of uh, what is required to ensure that the economic interest uh, continues and that environmental concerns do not override uh, um, uh, or the environmental uh, uh, um, incidents such as this. Um, are, uh, are not uh, are minimised and, and do not uh, uh, become such an issue um, that we begin to lose some of the economic benefit. But Marine Scotland is involved in this. The regulator is 
is a reserved, uh, uh, is a reserved matter. Um, and we are, uh, as always, involved in the discussions to ensure the best possible outcome for everything. I mean, my major concern is obviously the marine environment. And I am being assured this particular incident has minimal risk for the marine envir environment. It does not uh, impact the seabed. The seabed is too far below the surface of this. The, 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 the product of the uh, what's called produced water spill is crude oil mixed with seawater. It's not a, a, a straightforward oil uh, leak and it was a single event. It's not been a continuous uh, leak. So it is, it is at the absolute, I think, minimum uh, 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 in terms of uh, what may have happened. Uh, so I think we have been extremely lucky. But part of the outcome of all of the investigation will be to inform what future action is required and if enforcement is also necessary as a result of it. Thank you. A final topical from Rudy Grant. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask how long it will take for the oil to disperse naturally and whether it will be a risk to fish and sea mammals while that happens? Cabinet Secretary. I'm not advised of any such risk. Um, I can uh, try and establish if there's any estimate of the time it will take uh, for that dispersal to uh, occur. Um, and if that is possible to give that kind of estimate, I will ensure that the member uh, receives that. But at this point, I don't know whether or not it is possible to make any prediction about how long it will take that dispersal to take place. Can I thank the Minister and members? We're now going to move to the next item of business, which is a debate on the Finance Committee motion, and I'll just take a few minutes for everyone to change seats.